most of you have had lunch, a quick one at least. So this masterclass session is super important. It's based, again, on an IBC Oxford University webinar, which was really high quality and had really high global viewership, and it's really important. So it's called The Future of Surgical Stapling, What Do Surgeons Really Want? And I'm really delighted to invite, to chair this session, Professor Robin Blackstone from the United States and Professor Lee Swanstrom from France to chair this session. And I'd like to invite to the top table, the, the panel, uh, Professor Charles Zhang from China, uh, Dr. Farah Hussein from the United States, uh, Professor Maud Robert from France, Professor Michel Gagné from Canada, Professor Carl Miller from the United Arab Emirates, uh, Professor Almino Ramos from Brazil, Prof uh, Dr. Helmut Billy from the United States, Professor Jung Sung Park from South Korea, and Dr. Mohit Bandari from India. Uh, I'll hand over to Robin and Lee. All right. Um, Robin's missing in action, but uh, thank she's you. On the, she's on the way. I, I just saw her. Yeah, I sent her off to get, get some food, so um, we'll get started uh, here. And thank you, Harris, for giving this interesting topic. Um, as we talked about earlier today, staplers are very important to surgeons. Uh, and uh, as Robin and I were discussing, uh, they're so important. Uh, are, are, are surgical residents learning to sew enough? Should we be making them do hand-sewn anastomosis? Uh, so maybe we'll go down the row and ask uh, each of you to comment on the place of staples vis-a-vis -vis, uh, hand-sewn anastomosis. Jump in. Um, <clears throat> your point's well taken on how efficient and useful the staplers are to the point that they're almost obviating the need to teach people how to sew. But when the stapler malfunctions or when you look at it and you don't trust the staple line, now you're in a position where you really do have to have your residents. You have to find a modality to teach them how to suture so when those incidents occur, they're able to augment uh, the, the shortcomings in some staplers that we've talked about today. And I'll double down on the shortcomings now of suturing because also with the robotic platforms, that's also become a crutch for suturing to where laparoscopic sewing in particular is really becoming a little bit of a lost art. However, I do think that platform makes uh, for an easier time teaching suturing and is a great bailout for many people who perhaps weren't as skilled laparoscopically. Uh, but you do have to purposely make a place for suturing skills in uh, your training programs. Jeff? Yeah, it's the same. I mean, uh, everybody who knows me, who've been the fellows, uh, that the first thing that uh, we're doing is to learn how to sew, how to make knots, how to sew running uh, suture. Uh, I'm old enough to remember that in, in 1991, in, in Canada was the first in, in Canada was the first advanced laparoscopic bariatric course and this was beyond gallbladder and the first thing we, they were teaching by Barry McKernan if you recall this surgeon was <clears throat> to sew two bowel pieces together and I uh, had to put this under a sink to see if it was watertight and um, I used it since 1991 to teach my residents and fellows that they need to achieve that. And it's in fact a, a really a good indicator of how proficient that surgeon is going to be. Well, uh, we would usually, like Michelle said, we would usually ask our fellows to first train on a hand swing anastomosis and not permit them use a stapler because uh, I feel that we don't want a situation where they are stuck. Uh, and that is happening, you know. In U.S. now, fellows don't know how to do laparoscopy. They are just stuck with robotics. <laughs> I heard uh, in IFSO that they cannot convert a robotic to laparoscopy, and it's more easy to train them into robotics. But that, that's something which I'm very surprised at. Uh, we don't permit them to touch staplers without knowing a good bowel anastomosis. And I think stapling is just a modality to make job easy. It's not a substitute. Professor Zhang? Yes, uh, same in Korea. So uh, our uh, Korean uh, uh, Society of, of Surgery so have some uh, 
education program. So one is basic, one is uh, hand swing anastomosis, and the other one is uh, how to uh, operate a menu, uh, menu plate a surgical stapler for the, uh, our resident and our fellowship doctor. So I, I think it is a, a basic skill to uh, learn how to manipulate the surgical stapler for uh, current surgeons. Elmino. Yes, I, we have been working in, in training of uh, residents, fellows, and bariatric surgeons for 25 years. And uh, we try surgeon in using uh, staplers and uh, sutures. And it's impressive how we can improve the quality of the training of, of the surgeon with a two hours training. We have done this kind of uh, uh, trainings. We, we train the surgeons, we, we see the surgeon how uh, they use the suture, we train uh, hard for two hours, we do a test and we can see that they improve the quality of the suture. So we have been uh, doing a lot of courses like this. We think that is very important to know about suture, about staples, that, that, that that's, is the soul of the bariatric surgery. So another question, um, today, Carl, did you also, weigh in? Did you, Carl, do you speak? Uh, I, I spoke today a lot, but uh, <laughs> uh, stapling is one of my patients, one of my passions. Uh, you do you know make that. your residents stay <laughs> just So the topic is, what do surgeons really want? It depends. I live in Dubai and I live in Austria. Uh, in Dubai, it's very, very simple. They say, uh, I want to have it cheap. I want to have it very, very cheap so that I can offer my patients uh, uh, a cheaper surgery than my colleagues. If I look to Austria, I go back to the last century where I did studies on stapling. Perfusion is better than hand sewing. Uh, I, I really had enemies with old surgeons that are doing all the procedures hand sewing. Uh, I could demonstrate with very nice uh, uh, studies that stapled anastomosis are uh, better in the outcome, less complications, less leaks, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, that, that brought me the professor of surgery because not of bariatric, it was simply of stapling. And what really surgeons would want in Austria is the most safe device. And, and that gives me back to uh, to my boss, my former boss, uh, who brought the first stapling device from USSC, from US to, to Salzburg, where we could use those staplings. And he said, giving me that, this is a tool. And a fool with a tool is still a fool. And that is what he told me and what, I, what really uh, brought me to the rest of how can we train and teach surgeons that this is not only a tool, it's a tool that you, have to, uh, that you have to use properly. You have to know what's the tissue behind. It, it, it's not the bone, it's not rigid. So the stomach is one of the strongest organ. It has to, to melt, it has to uh, make our food smaller and to transport into the, into the small bowel. So, we really need to have proper strength, proper perfusion, and that is the reason why we really should emphasize on the safety checklist using staples. That is what, what I would comment to, to my topic, what I should talk today. So Carl, you're obviously not passionate at all about this. <laughs> um, I guess what the question that I had for everyone, and I know we've been talking about the importance of suturing as a backup to stapling, which you always need. Today, Lee talked about smaller staples through, through less, you know, trocars that are smaller. Um, we talked a little bit about staplers that dissolve. You know, what do you guys see as the real need for stapling? How would that evolve? I Elmino, mean, let's start with you. That, that's very simple. We need a staple with no bleeding and no leak. Yeah, in your dreams, <laughs> I'm afraid. <laughs> Maybe a magnetic staple, Michel. I totally uh, agree with this uh, 
definitely necessary to improve the stapler uh, to prevent bleeding and uh, leakage. Uh, but uh, what I want to do, what I want to is uh, for the height of the stapler to be uh, adjusted uh, automatically. Uh, we already know the entrum uh, we, when performing the sleeve gastrotomy. We already know that uh, entrum is the thickest area in. Uh, the tissue is thinner when we uh, move toward the uh, fundus. But uh, <clears throat> when choosing the height of the stapler, we usually rely on uh, our the previous uh, experience and uh, some guess, uh, we, because we cannot measure the uh, tissue and the thickness uh, during the surgery. So uh, I think when uh, clamping, uh, when clamping the tissue with a stapler, uh, it would be more uh, convenient if the uh, stapler uh, can measure the thickness of the tissue and uh, feedback uh, is provided to surgeon and the stapler um, is adjusted uh, automatically. Uh, so I think that that is the... Uh, I, but I'm not sure it is uh, technically uh, feasible currently, but I think that this is uh, most ideal uh, stapler. Yeah. So as part of that, let's just say um, that the stapler could provide you with a guaranteed digital signature, kind of like you get when you sign something that says, yeah, this was a perfect staple line. <laughs> you know, Robin, I think the problem is it has to tell us that before we fire it. And that's where I'm relying more. I use old mechanical handles because I still get a sense of information that comes through the handle to my brain as I squeeze it as to how much resistance there is. Maybe it's an old-fashioned thing that the new powered staplers are supposed to tell us, but I've yet to see a staple device, mechanical or powered, that tells me once I close the stapler that this is the right load. And if I see that it bleeds afterwards, what do we do? We downsize the staple cartridge. I need that information before. That would be really helpful. But le <clears throat> let's say we had uh, a robot with artificial intelligence would be able to make all those decisions. Would the robot suture or would the robot staple? Now that's simple. With the robot not stapled, because it's exactly what Billy said. You don't feel you just see. Uh, to suture with the robot is, is something that you can learn much faster than you, with, with laparoscopy, but, but the feeling of how to close the device is really, is really missing in the robotic. Uh, I, I'm not talking about the existing robot we have, but uh, ah, an autonomous yes. robot yeah, yeah. who would operate, Mohit. would they choose sutures or staples? No. Mohit. I don't think you had a chance to weigh in on this. Oh, absolutely. So uh, I think that when we look for the history of yeah, stapling <laughs> and we go to the time of the open surgery, I, I, I uh, uh, heard because I never did an open gastric bypass, but I heard that the number of leaks in that time was in between 2 to 4 percent. That is too high. Over time, right now, we, uh, we don't have leaks anymore, but we continue to have bleeding. So our big problem now, two, three percent consistently, it is bleeding. So we solve the problem of leaks, but we continue to have bleeding. So what we can do to avoid bleeding? Reinforce, to use uh, something in, in the cartridge to reinforce. I think th th that's the question right now. I think that we should reinforce because I don't ha like to have 3% of bleeding for my patients. So this, that's the reason that I continue reinforcing. So the problem with solving bleeding is that in order for it to, the edge to heal, you need to bring the cells there that will heal it. And so having perfusion of the edge is still desirable. And as long as you have that, you're going to have a risk of bleeding. Mohit, go ahead. I know it's hard to jump in on these guys, they're pretty... No, no, it, it's not hard. All of us are trying to make the same point, actually, but 
to add something different to it. I think we need artificial intelligence there, as Michelle was saying. And as far as I know, there are three platforms which are coming in future, uh, which will determine as to what length of staple height you need to use after grabbing the tissue. Uh, and it would also ask the surgeon to change that kind of uh, stapler height if it's not good in the cartridge. Also, once the surgeon's firing is done, and if there are chances that this staple line could bleed because of uh, no good B formation, they'll again give a feedback. So there is definitely going to be artificial intelligence on stapling in future. Uh, it would be a good learning tool for all of us because as Almino is saying, after doing so many procedures, he's still facing bleeds, which means there is something in there in the tissue which uh, we do not know about. Every tissue behaves differently and future would be artificial intelligence because there is some level of uh, expectation there uh, from the surgeons that they need a graded advice as to when and what to change and what to fire. Sarah? Almino, Almino's wish is bleeding. What do surgeons really want? So you want to have less bleeding. Uh, I, will, I will ask uh, the industry why not to develop staples that are coated with hemostats or why you don't use routinely hemostats when you have a sleeve, for instance, what I do, routinely as a prophylactic. Uh, that, 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 is, uh, that is something uh, where we say challenge him. Uh, the next topic is a smart device which measures, adjusts the right pressure, develops the, the proper length of the staples. Uh, I have seen this. This device in Turkey at the World Congress from Johnson & Johnson as a prototype, and it's still not on the market. So uh, I, I would say what surgeons really want, bring it on the market, what you develop. Vera? Yeah, I think I will agree with what many have said, particularly Dr. Bhandari and Dr. Billy, in that I think our poor man's measure for our smart stapler in the past was our manual closing on the tissue and feeling that. And I always thought if I have a small hand and I can close easily, the tissue must be thin. And if I struggle, it's a thicker volume of tissue. So to have a truly smart stapler that detects the thickness is probably the most realistic next wish on the list that will tell us that so we can potentially use a fully powered stapler with a little more reliability on that, not having to have it partially fire and then say it's failed, which has actually kind of increased my stapling frustrations to see that rather than having the manual feel that gave us our own feedback. You know, there are many people on this panel with deep experience with industry from the outside. But let me just give you a little bit of a preview of what it would be like to develop a stapler like you're talking about. 10 years from now, you might get it approved by the FDA. This, this process of us telling them this is what we want, we want something that doesn't bleed, the engineers figuring out what exactly it would take to coat the stapler with a hemostatic agent, the testing on so many animals, it's unbelievable, to determine whether that hemostatic agent actually works on a stapler and if it's better than what we have now. Then the clinical trial that would be required to test that in people followed by going to the FDA. This is a 10-year process, guys. This isn't like we invented in our heads today and it comes out of the pipeline tomorrow. Lee, I don't know if you want to comment well, on that. Well, I, I guess uh, the other side of that is what Carl mentioned is how much would you pay for that? So how much would you pay for a super smart? Twice as much as a standard stapler? Is it that good for you? Or if it reduced bleeding 20%, is it worth a uh, 20% uh, increase in cost? What goes through my mind is, or I could use SeamGuard, which has been FDA approved for decreasing bleeding. It does not. Uh, we don't have proper statistic that uh, this will decrease. Uh, you, you, you had 40,000 patients. If you have a big, big number, it absolutely demonstrates a significant reduction. The problem is Almino has done only 
let's say, 1,000 a year, uh, that, that's not enough to prove statistics. And, and that is what we are suffering. We, we really should focus on individual treatment. And you are absolutely right when you have the one other patient where you decide to use a, a, a buttressing material, you, you really might benefit. If you do it on everyone, you increase your, your, your cost and you want to let's say, measure in your group a reduction from 3%, where Alvino said, to 1%, that means 2% reduction. You need 100,000 patients to demonstrate that properly. So it, it's really the problem with statistics. Of course, uh, Michel, you wouldn't let it. <laughs> no, I w what, what I was going to say is that if it, it is possible to get down to nearly zero. Uh, I'm in my third year now of no bleeding, no transfusion. And it's, it's not only the staple, but it's before surgery, what you're doing to your patient, at surgery, and after surgery. So before surgery, I give tranexamic acid. I stop aspirins. I stop uh, NSAIDs. I, uh, <clears throat> there's many things. I don't give pre-op heparin. I give them post-op lomicular heparin because uh, at surgery, I tie now every vessel that I see. Yep. That is on the staple line, I cross with absorber. I mean, if people come to my operating room, they can't believe how many clips I put on all the branches of the gastroepiploic and near the spleen. I tie every little vessel, and then I get no bleeding post-op. Post-op, I use post-op glomicular heparin. So uh, all of these things together are probably overall the biggest strategy. It's not like I'm going to change the, stap the stapler and get no bleeding. I don't believe that. Yeah, and I, I think that you are pointing something out, which maybe even was the beginning of the thought, uh, this to conversation about suture, and that is meticulous technique is still, and, and technique means not only in the surgery, but in the whole scope of what surgery is, in the pre-run and the post-op care, that technique has to be meticulous. Uh, Michelle, you, you mentioned really very important steps. It's, it's multi. Yeah. Because if you look only on uh, transamino acid, trans acid. Uh, you will not see a, a significant difference. But it, the difference makes the, the entire process. All of that. <laughs> Cheap, smart, and uh, absolutely safe. And to figure out the optimal course of care so that everyone can achieve the same rate of bleeding that Dr. Gagne claims. So, so those are the end results, but if you, staplers are rather big and cumbersome and not terribly ergonomic, um, maybe don't, uh, articulate enough? I mean, what else would you want just from a usability standpoint? So ble bleedings are not coming just from the use of the staples. We have, uh, in maybe uh, in the sleeve gastrectomy, we have more bleeding coming from the vessels, uh, yes, in, in the greater curve than uh, properly from the, the staples. So that's not just about a staple. I think that's what, what Michelle told uh, to uh, uh, do a very meticulous hemostasis during the procedure is, is very important. I use, I, I reduce uh, my harmonic from three to two. I, in, for a sleep gastrectomy, I use harmonic in two, looking for having more in, in the level two, looking for having more hemostasis that, that cutting. I think this, that's important to use more clips I, I also it is important and talking about the staplers I, my, I, I wish to have a staple coming in, in a 10 or 9 or 8 uh, millimeter stroker I think that the staple we have now, right now it is too large and it is uh, very aggressive to the abdominal wall so uh, uh, to, to have a, 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 a lesser one would be very uh, important and uh, to move with a more hemostatic one. What we can do right now is change the color of the cartridge. And I'm, I'm doing also a, a lot of, in this job, I'm 
doing in, in a patient with BMI less than 40, I'm doing this leave. The first is uh, gold and other one uh, will be, it's gold, blue and, and white. I'm using white in, in stomach and I'm very satisfied with the result of this change in, in the color of the cartridge. I think tri-staple technology is very interesting also. So uh, I think that we, we have to continue. We can, with what we have right now, we can improve, but we need something better for the future. You know, Robin, it's, it's interesting because you and I are old enough to remember when all the cartridge we had was a 45 and it was blue and mm -hmm. it was four rows. And what we asked for, if this conference was in 1999, we would have asked for six row cartridges, bigger staplers, longer staplers, and now that we're comfortable with those, now we want to go back to smaller, less rows, and it will be a whole new process of building our confidence. Do we have any studies showing that three, three lines of staples are much better than two? I, I don't know. It just made us more comfortable with going ahead with our, our specialty. It gave us, emboldened us to do more difficult cases because whether we realized it or not, the six row met what we were asking for. It gave us less bleeding and it let us forge ahead. Now maybe that we're so good at the procedures with the old technology that we're now analyzing, maybe we will be able to go back and maybe minimize it. Uh, that, there is only a difference in colorectal. Uh, that's the reason why the, the industry developed then the 3D staples because the two row in the colorectal is um, not in favor compared to a three row. So uh, in, in, in bariatric or in intestinal surgery, we, we don't have proper studies on that because the development was so fast from 45 length where I started my laparoscopic bypasses and then immediately that was a game changer to have the 60 and, and so on. So uh, the, the, the question to have a smaller staple is really a cosmetic. It's not the abdominal wall because uh, uh, I closed the wall with, with hemostats, not with sutures. And, and, and that is uh, the reason when you, when you operate lower BMI, you, you really want to look on, on, on smaller sizes. Uh, why you don't use a vascular, in thoracic we have two rows where we, where we staple vessels. Yeah, we, we staple vessels with a, with a smaller stapling device. Why not uh, asking the FDA the, why we, the, we don't use them? The, the problem is not large vessels. The problems are small vessels. Yeah. <coughs> uh, your staplers will close and, and oppose tissue wall, like the stomach and the intestine. But when we go and do a, a, an aggressive sleeve and you are crossing all the small arteries coming from the branches, those staples are kind of not catching it well. And I think that's where the bleeding comes from in the staple line. It's from these small arteries that are caught in between. Now, those are not really well studied by, okay. by, yeah. by yeah. the test done in the lab. So we're gonna, we're just gonna go to some last comments now. Um, why don't you just make your last comment and then we'll tie up. We've got about three minutes. Elmino. Uh, if we, we talk about to have a smaller stapler, as, as Carl was saying, that's not about aesthetics. That's about less pain. That's about less hernia. That's about less bleeding because another cause of bleeding we have, it is related to the, to the staple. So uh, this is something that I would like to have a smaller staple with more hemostasis, uh, with no need of reinforcement, with uh, no leaks. Th th that's the, the goal for, for me. Thank you. Next. I think uh, it, 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 it is uh, on a, a little bit a different story, but uh, I think the bleeding is um, uh, is a problem of the not stapler is a but, uh, the patient characteristic because uh, uh, in Korea we performed a, a gastric cancer surgery and also the bariatric surgery. In, in gastric cancer surgery, we uh, removed all 
uh, all the best, major vessels, and we only save the uh, short gastric artery. So in the gastric cancer surgery, the bleeding is not so common problem. Uh, uh, leakage, or uh, this is uh, the main problem. But mm -hmm. in the bariatric surgery, the, uh, bleeding is very uh, bleeding, bleeding prevalence, uh, prevalence is very high. So I think that yes, that bleeding. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. I think no matter how much advanced we become in terms of surgical platforms, uh, the more and more advanced we become, we'll become more slow surgeons, like Michelle said. We'll be doing more and more hemostasis. So I think that is the trick here. You know, staplers would try. Every year a new platform would come, maybe artificial intelligence. Hemostasis and being meticulous about uh, the protocols is more important. Magnets will replace a I, I knew that was coming. You knew it was coming. Uh, yeah, yeah. And, and thank Big you, Dr. Gagne. Okay. Uh, Farah? <laughs> and thank you, Smart Stapler. Is this working? Um, the Smart Stapler principle is still foremost in my mind. If you can streamline a cartridge to be a single cartridge, when we talk about it's just maybe producing less of these different things that can be a waste in the future, too, would be good for all of us and maybe even the Earth. So. I would like the smart stapler to be smart. That the compressive forces that it senses will form a bee the way it was supposed to be formed. That it will minimize the malformed staple and I've chosen the right cartridge and it can correct me in some way. I think if we can do that, we will see hemostasis problems minimize themselves. Carl, you get the last word. Uh, give me 35 seconds. No, 15. Okay. Uh, I had the privilege uh, working with industry that I had to uh, review videos, videos of what went wrong. That was for me a great privilege to develop a safety checklist. Because what we have heard is at the moment a Christmas wish, a wish for birthday, we don't have. Actually we have to live with that what we have on the market and that what we have on the market we should use properly. That what I would like to recommend. Lee, did you want to close? No, I just wanted to thank the panel and my co-chairman co on the panel for a, a great debate and uh, hope you have a great rest of the conference. Yeah, good luck you guys, thank you. Thank you.